Welcome to the Champions Rugby Show with me, Martin Hindley. And our special guest today is quite simply a legend of Leinster. Back to Hickey. Hickey for the corner! That is awesome! He had a significant involvement in the match that helped launch Leinster rugby in Europe. He was a try-scoring record breaker and an inspiration for the Irish at international level. Excellent news that today we're joined by Dennis Hickey. Thanks for coming on the Champions Rugby Show, Dennis. And, and how are you doing these days? Very good, thank you. Nice to, nice to speak to you. Nice to be part of this, this podcast and this series. Um, I'm fine, I suppose. I'm like everyone else. As we're recording this, still here in Ireland in um, a lockdown as part of as part of the response to COVID-19. So um, it, it's strange times for everyone from a work perspective and uh, particularly I think in the context of this podcast, what is happening in the world of rugby. It's nice to be reflective in these sort of times, but uh, also be conscious of the challenges that the game faces currently and is going to face in the post-COVID world. These days we're used to, to full crowds and a lot of fanfare around matches in what is now the, the Heineken Champions Cup, but we we were discussing the very start of the, the competition uh, last week with Leon Lloyd, for, for example, and he was telling about going over to Dublin to face Leinster with a, a Leicester Tigers side in the second season of the tournament on a Wednesday afternoon and Jordan Murphy skipping school to, to come around and, and watch the game in, yeah, yeah. With, with crowds that were very, very different. I mean, what did you make of it when it first came around the, the European Cup? I think to give the context really from an Irish perspective is that Ireland, the club game in Ireland, the, I suppose, which is the level below the provincial game, which is obviously now the professional teams, was very large. So players were being... Uh, shared really between teams. So the Leinster, your involvement in the Leinster season was much more truncated, much more limited. The game, the team was semi-professional, really made up of the first round of professional players. I was in the first round of draft of contracts, really, in that, that 96 season. But there's lots of players in that match, even against uh, uh, Leicester, which was, a, which was a game we won, which was completely, it was a remarkable achievement for a club like Leinster, which was, even though, Leinster being around for a very long time as a professional or semi-professional club versus coming up against the might of, of Leicester with the history tradition they had and they were a huge club. Um, but even on that team, there would have been professionals, a very small number of professionals, semi-professionals and then amateurs. Uh, that's really where the game would have started from a Leinster perspective. In those days, we would have might have played for, we would have trained with Leinster for a certain period of time and then not being with Leinster for another maybe two months, three months. And all the pro- Irish provinces are like that. You go back to your clubs kick seven bells out of each other and then come back again for Leinster for the next round of, uh, of what was then the European Cup. So it was it was a very, very different time and Leinster were playing their games in those days in, in Donnybrook, the old Donnybrook Stadium. That was an old ground, you know, 5,000 people would have been a big crowd and Leicester on that day it would have been a very big draw, but not always. Leinster were a huge draw. The clubs, the club teams, as I said, the level below that was, you know, you could get 12,000, 15,000 in a very big game. Whereas Leinster might have a, a very small number, uh, you know, you might get a thousand, you might get two thousand. So things have changed so dramatically, I suppose, in in that period of time, that twenty three year period. It's it's hard to reconcile. It's hard to reconcile the two when you see you look back on some of those games. When we look at rugby these days, we're looking at wall to wall coverage from all over the world. Um, we're looking at, at very very easy access to see how how rival clubs might play. I mean, how were you prepared to play clubs from France or Italy or even England back in those days without all of that wall to wall coverage? It must have been very very difficult to understand what was coming next. I think Irish rugby, particularly at that time in the nineties, it's it it would have it would have had a very large inferiority complex and not undeserved. You'd have to say. You know, the clubs were kind of really in their infancy and trying to form together, even though, you know, traditionally Leinster, Munster, Ulster played against each other. So three matches a year, that was it. And then, so we're trying to build a club ethos and you're going up against, even in those days where, as you said, there wasn't as much coverage, but, you know, there was even at that point a, a, a top tier, certainly a kind of a, a royalty to, to the big clubs in Europe, Toulouse, Leicester. And even even in, that, in, in, in the, you know, Toulouse, Leicester, uh, you talk about Bath, Harlequins would have been a big name because, you know, I remember as a you know, kid watching it would be special. So you'd know all those big clubs and those big clubs would have had big crowds when there was no crowds watching Irish rugby or certainly not, not comparable crowds. So they were known as big clubs. And then you'd have been aware of the large clubs in France, as I said, like the Toulouse, Toulon, Biarritz. And also then as well, the Welsh clubs were, were, were still very strong and still in their original, uh, in those early days, in their original form. Uh, you know, you would have had Swansea, you would have had 
neat in the early days. So, you know, Ireland, Irish rugby, Irish clubs were very much down the pecking order, but going to Toulouse was, you know, going to a different planet and you know, to a full professional team. And Leicester and Leicester was such a step up. And Irish rugby really struggled to, to keep pace at that point. And you got, we picked off teams every now and then, like we picked off Leicester that year. The, the big difficulty for, for all the Irish teams, Munster, Leinster, and Munster, was the trips abroad, like winning in the UK, winning in the English clubs, winning in France, almost impossible, you know, a very, very difficult, a very, took a very long time. Ulster were European champions in, in 1999, beating Toulouse and Stade Francais and Colomier in the final in, in Lansdowne Road. Munster then into the final in 2000, losing 9-8 to Northampton and a, a couple of near misses in the in the semi-finals. Did you notice when you went to Ireland duty that some of those players from the provinces and also you, yourself, did you feel more prepared for international rugby as, as a result of those experiences, even if the results for Leinster at the time hadn't quite been what you were hoping for on the road? I think in that 99 season and into 2000, as Irish teams, and as you said, Ulster starting with Ulster with a win, and then Munster particularly getting as far as it did away from home. Um, the Irish team started winning on the road more. Ulster had a good run at home to get to that final, which, as we know in Europe, is a big advantage. And then Munster became the first team really to get to grips with winning away. You'd win away in Wales, might have been the first step. Then team, the Irish team started winning away in the UK, sorry, in England. And then the big step, though, up was winning in France. Every single team playing at home, French team at home, was, was at a different level than they were when they played away. So the steps made by both those teams certainly gave them confidence, and that confidence ultimately gave everyone confidence. You know, the game was developing, professionalism in the Irish game was developing, and as you say, kind of rising tide lifts all boats. So the, the general standard in Ireland was going up. The teams were pulling each other in, in competition, uh, trying to outdo each other and trying to go further than each other. Uh, and that season, that 99 and then ultimately that 2000 season was a turning point. It also was you know, mirrored then by the 2000 season was a kind of a, a start of a, of a successful run for a group of players in the Irish context. So all those things were coming together. The Irish success, particularly at that stage, was built on the increased improvement in performance in Irish teams in Europe. And uh, the Irish teams probably have benefited the national game has, has been built on the bedrock of success in Europe probably unlike any other teams from other countries that play in the European game I would say. It's interesting that you mention about the challenges uh, of going to France it brings us on to one of the the greatest days in, in Leinster rugby's history in the quarterfinal in, in 2005-06 so just as we rewind there second in the pool stage behind Bath and then Explain what kind of mission impossible it must have seemed at the time to go and play the holders in Toulouse on a beautiful day away from home in a Heineken Cup quarterfinal. Uh, what do you remember about the build-up to that match and how did you overcome, not a fear, but the, the respect that the Stade Toulousain back in those days absolutely commanded as, as double European champions at the time? You know, that, that match... Going back to 2002 was the first time Leinster had even won in the road in France. So we beat Montfrand, Clermont, Montfrand as they were called then. 2002 was the first time in trying that, our, uh, that Leinster had won on the road in France. We then won the following season against Bourguin in Bourguin. So going into that match in 2006, we'd only ever won twice in the road in France and never had a knockout at that stage. Um, so again, as difficult as it was to win in, in France or Leinster, in group stages to step it up again and then have to go to try and beat Toulouse in France in a knockout competition. I think that's a team that were already multiple cup winners. They had won the first tournament uh, and they had been uh, an exceptional powerhouse of, um, and, and, and uh, leading team in Europe. And they had the experience. They knew how to win in knockout competitions in both domestically but particularly in, in Europe. They were the season team. They also had a very, very strong team uh, at that stage. So going, the prospect of going to face them in Toulouse was daunting from an organisational point of view. But the team was coming together better under um, under our new coach at that stage, Michael Michael Checa. And I would say going into that game, we had a, a level of preparedness. Our, our coaching team had, had done a huge amount of work going into the match. 
that gave us a lot of confidence, but we were still very aware of where we had come from in Europe and that this was going to take a performance, a step up that we, uh, to a level that we hadn't yet reached in Europe. You scored a try which is still celebrated as one of the best and most iconic in the history, the quarter of a century history of what is now the, the Heineken Champions Cup, partnering with Gordon Darcy. Um, your memories, your recollections of that sensational moment in the, the history of the tournament. Well, I, there's, a, there's a couple of parts to that try. Obviously, everyone, depending when, you, if you look back on that, depending on the, the, the footage, when you start the footage, you get a sense of the try. So, obviously, I'm at the end of a passage of play. Uh, it's really when you go back and, and when I look, look back and every time I've ever looked back on the footage of that, I always go back to when, really when the ball started in play. And, you know, what, what makes, for me, what makes that try special, and obviously I was delighted to have scored the try and delighted it's it's remembered it's fond, a fondly which is by lots of supporters by, by other people, if that's the case. But it comes on the back of a very long passage of play where both sides have the ball. The ball changes uh, sides from, you know, it starts in the scrum and Leinster have it, then, then, uh, then Toulouse have it, goes back to Leinster. There's an element of luck whereby Dave Pearson, the referee, lots of referees will have, a, will have an opportunity in a passage of play of that length to blow for a knock-on, to not play advantage, to, you know, maybe be, be a little bit more pedantic with the with the whistle, but Dave Pearson, to his credit, let the game flow and had let that passage of play go on. So there'd be knock-ons, there'd be turnovers, there'd be, you know, was it a knock-on, was it a knock-on hitting off people's heads? But he let the ball, he let the ball play and, and the ball, and the, and the passage of play goes from end to end. And that's what makes it, for me, that's why I'm, I'm delighted to score the try, but I'm delighted to Scored a try at the end of what was a really exciting passage of play. Dempsey goes down, advantage to Leinster. It's breathless stuff. Incredible. Michelak, he nearly gave it away. It's on again. Gondipomi says we'll go. Hickey. Hickey is racing away and he's going to get past Palouse. He's got to time his pass. Darcy, back to Hickey. Hickey for the corner! If you're going to score a, a, a try of that nature, you know, to squeeze in the corner is the most dramatic um, end to a try you can probably have. And again, all, all those little elements are there, lots of interplay, backs and forwards, lots of great players from both sides touching the ball in that passage of play, for me, is what makes a, a special try. It was a breathtaking passage of play. The match finished 41-35 in itself was a was such a pace uh, about the game. It was very, very intense. Um, it's been heralded as the, the match that launched Leinster rugby in Europe and really started the quest for what is now four stars and obviously a quest that this season is looking for a fifth. Um, how important was that match to you as you look back on, on the Leinster history in Europe and, and how instrumental was Michael Checker in what we now see on that jersey as, as four Leinster stars in Europe. Well, I think I'll leave it to other people to to place the importance of that match in the history of Leinster rugby. I think it, it's be a little, it might be a little bit self-serving for for someone who's on the team to say, well, actually, that's really where it all began. Um, so, if it's seen as such, uh, I think that's uh, maybe people who have achieved more with Leinster uh, who can point to that. I'm happy to go with that. I think what it did, what it did prove. To Leinster as a team, we could win on the road in France in a knockout competition. Again, maybe take a little bit more for granted in 2020 than it was in 2006. This is the first time. And, and winning against a big club away, again, gave the club huge confidence. It provided us with an army of supporters, which I wouldn't underestimate. You know, when we went to we went to Montferrand to play that match in 2000, 2003, if there were 50 travelling Leinster supporters, maybe, most of them were parents of the players, maybe a hundred maximum. Whereas we had a huge crowd that went in that, and I still have people come up to me today and say, "I was at that match in Toulouse. It was, you know, one of the best occasions I've ever been at at a rugby match." So we had a huge number of travelling supporters who had a fantastic experience, who became Leinster fans really after that. And Leinster, the Leinster fan base was was still growing at that stage. It certainly was nowhere near where it is now. So. I think the game was transformed from an organisational point of view because, as I said, it, it really created a, an occasion for Leinster supporters which got a lot of them hooked. And ultimately, it gave the organisation confidence to be able to say, OK, we can win we can win on the road. That's one thing we haven't done. We can beat the big teams in the knockout stages if, on the road if we have to. And we can go on and do more in this competition. 
there's a saying that's come about in the the Heineken Cup down the years that you've you've almost got to lose a big one to to win a big one. Did did Leinster as a club need to to go through the disappointments of the semi final in two thousand and six to then get up in two thousand and nine in an incredible semi final against the the same opponents after your retirement? Well, I think if you only had to lose one to win a big one, uh, it wouldn't be so bad. I think most of the, the big European teams can point to multiple disappointments, multiple significant disappointments. We had lost the semi-final in that 2002-2003 uh, season, which was hugely disappointing at the time. A home semi-final against Perpignan, a game that was certainly within our uh, ability to win. We then got to 2006, a match against Munster, and that was a devastating blow for the team and a devastating blow in confidence of the organisation. Fledgling confidence, it has to be said, after, after having taken that step to not be able to back it up. And that's, you know, there's, there's almost a path even there for teams. It's, you know, your organisation has to learn. It has to have this this history, this bitterness that builds up within groups of players and then is passed down to be able to draw on that experience, not just the experience of what to do in those games, but actually the experience the memory you feel from the disappointments of losing those games that spurs you on for the next season, that you recall those matches, you recognize and go, here here we are again, we're in this position last year, you know, here, here's how we have to do this differently. And every team goes through that. I think any team that has won Saracens has gone, Munster have gone through it, the French teams have gone through it, you know, Claremont, you can see that the, the you know, a huge club like Claremont who are still, you'd have to say, on that journey, hasn't managed to crack the European Win, but they've had some they've had some seismic disappointments and you've got to think for a club like them it's going to come but for it happened for it has happened for so many of the big the big european clubs that's the journey they have all been on we certainly were set back so hugely from that semi-final loss that it became a big driving force for a core group of players there to restock to recheck where they were and to really understand what was going to have to be done to go one better Agara, might think of dropping back in the pocket but he hasn't stringer feeds him now O'Gara, he's through! Oh, Ronan O'Gara! He's done it! That's it! He knows it! Munster know it! Europe will know it! Munster are going to another Heineken Cup final! Finally in 2009, with those blue ribbons on alongside the green of Heineken at, uh, at Murrayfield, beating Leicester Tigers, and after the match... Brian O'Driscoll mentioned you and your contribution to, to Leinster in his post-match interview, uh, even after retirement. What did that mean to you to have that recognition as part of, not just individually, but as an integral member of the Leinster family in 2009? Um, well, it was, it was certainly a very, uh, a very nice touch. And, you know, Brian took, the, the, took a very nice moment to reflect, I suppose, among the people who'd been uh, with him as part of that journey. So I was... It was a very nice touch from from him, which I appreciated. But it was unusual. I had been I had retired from the game in 20, uh, 2007, the 2007 World Cup. I had been traveling for a year, completely out of Ireland and away from rugby, and I had come back. And it was actually the day of my sister's wedding. Um, it was the first year actually that we'd been in, as a family made to plan anything that didn't involve having to work around a Ireland Cup season. And ironically. Turns out the day that Leinster managed to get to the first uh, Highland Cup, so in true form for our family, the wedding was disrupted while everyone watched the wherever we watched the games. So I remember watching the game in. Uh, um, I slipped away to the hotel room where the wedding was on. I was able to watch it, and I have to say, I um, felt such a sense of relief that Leinster had actually won that match. And I think people expected me to feel maybe pangs of jealousy or regret or not being involved, but my overriding sense when the trophy was lifted was of relief, of relief that Leinster had actually taken that step. We're not going to be the team that nearly won the tournament many times or should have won the tournament or, you know, weren't able to win the tournament. Even though I wasn't playing for Leinster anymore, it meant so much to me as a Leinster man, as a Leinster player, to be part of an organisation, even associated with an organisation as I was then, that was a champion team, that was the best team in Europe that year. And had, that had gone over, gotten over the, the disappointments and had been able to take that step. That was the overriding feel I had, was a pure relief. It has been a squad effort. It has to be to win this trophy. And suddenly, yes, all those semi-final misses vanish away. As Leinster, their team, their management, their supporters realise now they are champions of Europe.
It's Leinster's day with destiny, and they deserve it too. Has that emotional attachment continued to the the turnaround final in Cardiff against the the Saints, to um, to the demolition of Ulster in Twickenham, and to Bill Bow against Racing, and even last year coming out on the wrong side against Saracens? Do you still feel that emotional attachment when you when you watch those finals? I, do, I certainly feel very proud to be associated uh, with Leinster and to have been part of Leinster because I think they're a fantastic team. You know, they are the best or amongst the best club and the most certainly the most successful clubs to play in Europe. And this club they've become is, is phenomenal considering the beginnings of, of 25 years ago. So the bit I enjoy most is the, I suppose, the association with the team who consistently turns up and delivers in those big games. When Leinster gets to the knockout, stage of the tournament, it's always going to be there or thereabouts. And there is a expectation based on performance, not just based on it's not based on reputation, it's not based on, on entitlement, it's based on a level of performance that Leinster tend to deliver in these big games. If it's great to be a supporter of a team where you turn on and think, okay, this is a huge game, but well, Leinster will be there or thereabouts. Doesn't mean they're always going to win. Well, they were, their, their defeat to Saracens last year was was very, you know, must have been incredibly difficult for the team because it was very difficult as a supporter, uh, as someone who has an understanding of the, the, the type of dedication and work that goes into getting uh, to that stage in the tournament, if not having done it myself. But you also know that that Leinster will be there, there about. So I, I do get emotionally involved in those big games uh, and I really enjoy watching them. But it doesn't just, it, one thing I don't miss and one thing I still recognise is the crushing looks of disappointment on the faces of players when they fall short in these games. It always brings you back to those low days, uh, which are part of the tournament and they're part of the, the emotion of rugby. And uh, while it's, it's uh, you, you certainly miss those huge days, you, you, know, you, you, you maybe don't miss those lows. So um, I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, respect for every team who's playing in, in, in these big games. Leinster players, the teams they're playing against, uh, the effort, the dedication, the work, uh, the sacrifice that goes in. It's great to watch the big occasions in Europe. There really is, uh, there really is nothing like it. And, uh, you know, I wait, hopefully, to see the conclusion of this year. This year's Heineken's Heineken Champions Cup. And I hope Leinster are there, thereabouts again in this one. But um, we'll just have to wait and see how that one unfolds. Well, I think he's kept more than one or two people going through the, the lockdown period to know that when we come out the other side, we have another Leinster Saracens classic to look forward to in a, in a quarter-final of, of the European Cup, the, the Heineken Champions Cup these days. Dennis, thank you so much for sharing your recollections from a quarter of a century. Congratulations on all that you achieved and we hope that you, um, that you continue to enjoy the tournament and uh, especially when those boys in blue are playing over the coming months. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Some terrific recollections there from Leinster rugby and Ireland legend Dennis Hickey. And isn't it amazing, that sense of family and community that came out in his recollections of the 2009 Heineken Cup final, when the Blue Ribbons finally went on that trophy alongside the green of Heineken in Murrayfield after that victory over the Leicester Tigers. Some more fantastic stories coming up with more European legends very shortly on the Champions Rugby Show podcast. Please subscribe and rate the show if you can. And uh, a little review does no harm as well if you enjoy it. Until the next time, from me and from all the team, thank you and goodbye.